tell the world about my business. Okay, so um, I am the owner of Dynamic Therapeutics. My name is Dr. Tanya Butler. And uh, what we do is we're really just dedicated to helping people who are in chronic pain. And the, uh, we help them through specialized uh, massage techniques. And, you know, what we do is we help them find relief by um, using medical massage techniques, which is not typical to what you see in a spa where it's really just relaxation. Lots of times it does not feel good when you come in and see us, but you're already in pain. So we help to restore quality of life by teaching a lot of self-care techniques and corrective exercise so that, you know, once we do our part, the things that you cannot do. We teach you how to keep those results and continue it so that they don't return so that you can live a pain-free life. So what's, so so how how did you get into that overall? How did I get into it? That's a million dollar question. I actually came from a sports background Mm -hmm. and, um, it's, it's really kind of ironic how our life path um, brings us to certain things. I never in a hundred years thought I would be doing this. My mm-hmm. first life, I was a professional musician, but really? I was, I was. What, um, what, I, what, were you like classically trained or? I'm a classically trained flute, piccolo, and oboe player. I used to play for the U.S. Army Band. Interesting. Yes. Very so interesting. I was injured on active duty mm-hmm. and um, lost my music career. And I went through uh, a year of three complete reconstructive surgeries. And so after leaving the military and still being in chronic pain, Mm -hmm. going through all the doctors and the VA system and everything there, I still had a lot of pain in my face from all the surgery. And I was referred to a massage therapist and it was a really interesting process and as much education and knowledge as you can get in how the body works, nothing prepares you and teaches you um, rather than going through it. And the lessons I had on muscle memory, when we first started, she couldn't even touch me. And um, it became, it was a two year healing process Mm -hmm. to, you know, where I um, was no longer in pain. So fast forward, you know, I chalked that up as a fantastic experience of, you know, uh, a healing modality that I probably never would have tried unless somebody told me about it. I never even had a massage before. And so years later, um, being a professor at the university, I taught exercise science and sports performance and and using some manual therapy to help athletes um, increase their sports performance, become better athletes. And um, state legislation changed to where they said that, you know, only certain people could put their hands on Mm -hmm. others doing this. Well, in our job, we have to put our hands on people to make corrections and, you know, and, and work with, you know, just different things. So it was not a battle. I wanted to fight, right. and I called up the local medical massage school and said, what will it take for me to get a license? And so I did that, and I never thought I would use it as a profession, uh, but here I am um, owning this business and thriving and having more people than we know what to do with and um, you know, bringing in more our therapist and training them to help this because we there's a need for what we do. Mm-hmm. And even though there's a, a lot of spas out there and a lot of people who want some relaxation, there are a lot of people who are in pain and soft tissue pain that is not being addressed by medical doctors or physical therapists. And so we're fitting into a key role and really um, helping people in a very different way. That's interesting. So there's, you said there's a lot of people that are not being treated as they should for the, these, this, um, is it inflammation that they ha- may have or joint pain or what? Well, it's a lot of things. I mean, a lot of injuries are soft tissue, meaning okay. that, okay. yeah. And so um, orthopedic doctors do not deal with soft tissue. They deal with bone. So what do you do with a scar tissue um, afterwards and all of the pain 
and the inflammation that's in that tissue. Mm-hmm. What do you do with that? Mm-hmm. Anti-inflammatories only do so much. Right. And so if you don't help restore balance in that tissue, you're going to have chronic pain issues. And then you're going to be in a cycle of medications trying to numb this. Mm-hmm. So there, there are a lot of things that we do to help restore that balance and to help with scar tissue and what we call myofascial adhesions, that tissue between the muscle and the skin, um, helping uh, people to, you know, just heal by getting space in there and and increasing range of motion within, you know, different parts of the body. Hmm. So both athletes and, you know, and just the general population of people who have had some sort of injury or or just chronic um, overuse uh, people sitting at a desk and your body starts adapting to a certain position and then you start getting back pain or, um, you know, between the shoulder blades and low back. Well, what happens, and this is where we teach the corrective exercise part of it, when you shorten one part of your body, the other side lengthens. Mm-hmm. And so you start getting pain because of an area being overstretched and and adapting to a position that it wasn't anatomically created to be in. And so that's some of the stuff that we help and correct and give them exercises to prevent that and to counterbalance the stuff they're doing on a daily basis. Yeah, that's um, that's hugely important, especially if you have like a major injury and that injury mm-hmm. has caused your body to become stiff or if you, like you said, sitting at a desk. Um, or if you drive trucks, or if you're yes. just prone to being in one position for a long time, and then twenty, you know, twenty nineteen, that happened. A lot of people have those those jobs, you know, and yeah. so yeah, it's it's you know it's 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 important that you have some kind of um, rehab or a way of kind of like exercising and getting your body moving around, ideally while you're at work, kind of making yourself get up and move around. And obviously that's not enough, but it is something that could help. Right. And though there is a ton of information out there for people, I think what has happened is that there's sometimes too much information and we're over inundated to what we need to be doing specifically Mm -hmm. for us. And that's where we just break it down and say for you, because of what you're doing and what's going on, these are the specific exercises for you. And we keep it very simple. I don't give any more than three. And once that becomes a habit, then I'll start adding some things onto it. But I think it's really just about simplifying and personalizing the process so that people don't quit just because there's too much information and it's too daunting to try to figure out how to take care of themselves. Right. I mean, you sit around and you just analyze everything rather than picking something and then just doing it and then seeing what happens. It might work, it might not, but at least you're getting feedback. So I yes. can see where people could get lost in just consuming information and not actually taking action because they probably probably already found something that's going to work for them, but they're so busy trying to um, mentally be satisfied that they found a direction to go in that they don't do anything at all um, or they only they, they half-ass it and then they don't necessarily go as far as they as they could with it. Well, and I think the bigger problem is that we live in a world of instant gratification now. Mm -hmm. And so if it doesn't work on the first time, people give up. And soft tissue injuries do not heal the same as bone. You know, bone, for the most part, has a predicted length of time for healing. Soft tissue does not. And that depends on the injury, on the individual's health, and so many other things, and what they're willing to do to help themselves along. So... One of the things that we talk about is understanding that this is not a one-time fix. Mm -hmm. Um, This is something that you've spent 20 years getting yourself into this situation. We can't reverse it in one session or one um, instruction. So that's why it's so important to um, individualize this and give them a plan that is simple for them to keep doing the same thing on a regular basis to counter this so that they do start seeing results. But I think that's a problem is that when they look up information and they try it one time and they didn't get anything out of it, or even two times didn't get anything out of it, they don't have someone telling them, it just just wait, it's gonna take more than that. It's gonna take you doing this every single day for weeks to reverse this. 
And I think that's where our problem is. We just quit too easily. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm immune to that. Um, I've definitely had my, my struggles and overcoming physical challenges that I've had. But um, so like the, the, the people that you work with um, specifically, uh, is it, you said it catered to a lot of sports industries? I do sports, mm-hmm. but I also, it's interesting where I'm located down here. I have a lot of snowbirds. And okay. so I get some seasonal, a lot of retirement. Mm-hmm. Um, so I get some aging issues, but I have people who are way more active in their retirement years here than they were before. And so a lot of golfing, mm-hmm. a lot of golf injuries, but yeah, my background is in sports. And so, you know, I work with the local universities, athletes, um, to help with some of the minor injuries related specifically right now is soccer. Mm -hmm. And so working with a lot of the soccer players for overtraining issues um, and just minor injuries that, you know, soft tissue work can restore quickly and also enhance their overall performance. But yeah, we're, we're kind of split in the work that we're doing. We, we have the tough cases of the medical massage and then we have, you know, the sports side of it. Hmm. So what's your favorite part to, I guess, is there, I mean, aside from just working in the industry in general, is there a favorite, um, I guess, type of client that you like working with? Like, do you, like, I guess the guys that are getting injured on the golf courses or the <sighs> sports guys that are coming in? Like, have you, have you, have you noticed a difference in the way that people complain about the problem that they're having based on their age? Yes, actually, that's interesting that you you say that because um, I think I find people as they age are um, more accepting of the fact they don't like the fact that they're aging, but they understand that a lot of their injuries are are because they're getting older and it is just part of age. And so they're a little more patient with the healing process than some of my younger clients who want it fixed now. Right. And so, I mean, that, that is interesting. I didn't really think about that until you said, you know, you asked about that. But it is. I, I find that I love working with older people because, um, you know, they, they're at a point in their life that, I mean, if you ever want to know the truth about anything, ask an older person uh, an old person <laughs> and ask someone under the age of six, cause they're both going to tell you the truth with nothing to lose. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but as far as a favorite client, I think, you know, I, I've got two favorite clients. I like those who, who challenge me, who come in because they have seen everyone and they're at their wits end and they're still in a lot of pain and no one is helping them. And uh, I take a lot of time on their initial assessment to really listen to their their history and to figure out what's been done. The good thing is a lot has already been done, MRIs, um, x-rays, things like that. So mm-hmm. I have a lot of diagnostics to look at. Gotcha. And then um, what is so exciting to me is to be the one that figures out the problem and figures out that it's a soft tissue injury that no one has addressed. Hmm. And to see them get the results and feel like, you know, something miraculous has happened, that's exciting for me. And it's exciting for me to have to really dig in the books and uh, research some of these problems because um, I really, really want them to um, have a pain-free life because it takes so much of your life away where you cannot participate with your family or do the things that are important to you because you're in chronic pain. Right. And then the other side of it is, I mean, I absolutely love working with athletes because that's my background is sports. So I recently got a new client in who uh, she's a MMA fighter. Mm -hmm. And and those are some of my favorite athletes because – Oh yeah, because one they're completely beat up and <laughs> and two, I mean, they have to perfect every part of their body 
for balance, for stability, for strength, mm-hmm. for endurance. And so not only am I helping the tissue to recover from some of this brutal training and from the fight, but they're also so very receptive to learning anything that is going to make them better. Yeah. And that's what I love. I, I love working with athletes. That's great. So uh, I've, is there something that you've surprisingly found out about your craft after working with so many people that you're like, wow, I didn't realize that I would be able to, um, or something or someone that touched you in such a way in your practice that it changed the way that you actually approach your work? Well, I think the biggest thing that I realized because I came in this um, from a very different perspective, not expecting this to be my job, but just to allow me to legally put my hands on people doing the work that I was already doing. Mm-hmm. I think I gained a whole new respect for the industry because um, I realized that a lot of people look at massage as a luxury. And I understand why, because when I thought of massage, I only thought about spas and, you know, nice hotels that had massage therapists in there. It was a special treat for something that you did. Uh, But it's not, there's a whole nother side of it. And and the word, there's two words to the title, it's massage therapy. And so where I gained the respect and it changed the way I look at everything about what I do is the therapy part of this. And what changed is me realizing that there is a critical need for people like us to do what we're doing because it is a missing link in the chain of healthcare and um, helping people to restore the full balance to their lives and not just little pieces of it. Right. Um, and so I, I think that's what changed it and why I became so passionate about what I'm doing and helping people the way we are and why I get so excited when you know you hear like a chronic issue is plantar fasciitis. Um, so many people have pain in their feet for different reasons, whether it's a weight change or injury or chronic use or something, um, you know, podiatrists were the only people who ever treated that. And, you know, after spending a year of about 11 um, national conferences for podiatrists teaching them some different techniques, I realized that, that only some of them are open to looking at um, using some alternative techniques outside of, um, you know, most of the time what they do are orthotics and injections. And what we can do as medical massage therapists for plantar fasciitis is uh, unbelievable, where we can reverse plantar fasciitis in someone in a, in a short amount of sessions and by teaching the self-care opposed to a chronic state of pain where I people eight years later still have pain and they've seen everyone. Right. That's where I think that's changed everything because you see what this industry can do for people. Mm-hmm. Just over the time that you end up learning um, and watching the trends change, how has the, how has the industry changed? I'd uh, say over the last uh, several years. Um, well, I've seen um, some good and some bad. Mm-hmm. I've seen the good part is that insurance is actually recognizing this as a viable um, health care treatment. And though they still limit the amount of sessions that a person can have, sometimes just one a month, Mm -hmm. um, they're not seeing that much value in it. The other side of it, I think that um, a lot of the schools are not teaching the medical side of this and are streamlining people straight into spas uh, because, you know, it's about numbers sometimes. And when people need numbers to make money and make a living, they're going to go to their fastest path to cash. And when a lot of people do not, the general public doesn't understand that there is another side to this industry. Mm -hmm. It can be difficult sometimes to grow a business like this because you first have to work on 
you know, the um, public recognition of your service. So it, those are some of the interesting changes I've seen. Uh, they're both good and they're not so good. Okay. Yeah, it's, I guess as time changes on and like you just said, like people will, in times of desperation, they will go to the fastest and most easiest pathway to get cash. And it can happen. In, yes. It happens in every industry. It's not just restricted to one vertical. It's across, It's just across the board. Yep. Um, yeah. People will go the path of least resistance um, because they just want to. They're not playing. Long, they don't want to play the long game. And they just, they're in it. And yeah. they usually end up losing in the long run because they're trying to move so fast. Well, and I think that's a problem with entrepreneurs is that because, number one, there's not enough education. Um that teaches people to become their own business owners. Unless you go to school for business and you take some courses in, you know, entrepreneurship or you take some classes here and there, you know, most people just start a business because they had a hobby and they wanted to make some money out of it and they didn't want to work for someone else. Mm -hmm. I think the way that, you know, we would eliminate that fast path to cash is if people plan better um, coming into building their own business and came in with more capital so that they could play the long game. So then are you suggesting that, um, that people either a find an investor and then give away portions of their company before they even got started or B um, go to school, which really, I don't, do you think that's that entrepreneurship is um, a talent like playing a sport or singing or dancing or being a painter um, or being a musician, or do you think it's something that can actually be like learned in a classroom no, setting I, specifically? If you look at any great musician, mm -hmm. artist, or athlete, there is a small amount of talent and a large amount of preparation, right? I prepare, agree. Um, and training and hard work, mm -hmm. and so. It's, you know, there are a lot of talented people out there who do nothing with it. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't put that hard work, training, and preparation behind it, you're not going to be good at anything. I don't care how talented you are. Right. I so agree I 100%. think it's a, yeah. So I think it's a combination of all of that. I think that you need education to teach you the things that you do not know. You need um, coaches to help you. You need to find people who are more successful than you and learn from them. But you definitely need to know um, the foundations of how things work. And that means that you need to educate yourself. And then you combine your talent and you find what your skills are and you, you partner yourself with people who bring up your weaknesses and who's going to find balance. I think investors is really um, dependent upon the kind of work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. I didn't need investors to do what I'm doing. Um and I, I don't think that um, in, in certain industries that it's appropriate or necessary. Right. But I do think that it's appropriate and necessary for you to plan ahead of time and know what your expenses are mm -hmm. and make sure that you have that before you get into it. Right. Definitely knowing your P&L and making sure that, um, that you have, there's a market demand and that you actually have a plan of what you're going to do. But sometimes also just getting started and fumbling and like learning from the experience, like you said, like in the education process, the earlier you can make a mistake, the better, because then you're just getting that out of the way. Cause you're going to make mistakes no matter what. And some people don't get started because they're afraid of how they'll look in the eyes of other people because they've made a mistake. It's like, it doesn't matter. You're going to make mistakes and other people's opinions don't matter. Even if they're the best in the industry, their opinion doesn't matter. You still have to go ahead and, and try and do and fail and succeed and learn from it. And like you said, reaching out to people, finding mentors, finding other people you can learn from. Luckily, we live in an age where we actually have access to people at our fingertips. You might have to send 100 emails, but eventually mm -hmm. you, can, you can potentially break through or at least learn from that to pivot to someone else. Yes, but I'm not, I'm not necessarily going to agree with the you know, the whole part of uh, opinions don't matter because mm -hmm. if there are opinions of other people who are influential mm -hmm. in your industry or in your area, mm -hmm. they do matter. And that means that it is important for you to do the right thing the right way, understanding that you're going to make mistakes mm -hmm. and be okay with that. But yes, 
opinions do matter when you're trying to build your business Mm -hmm. and trying to um, get recognized for some of the work you're doing. So it's important that you do keep that in mind. So whose opinion are we talking? Are we talking the people who have been in the industry or the market's opinion? Um, I think that um, it's, you know, a lot of the market's opinion okay. because if, if they don't like you, they're not going to buy from you. Right. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Because uh, I was thinking of when you said that, I was immediately thinking of uh, like, uh, I think it's called Who's Got Talent or America's Got Talent. And this uh, girl yeah. named uh, Lindsay Sterling went on. She's a violinist. And mm-hmm. she had this idea that she wanted to do like this performance art with violin. So she had the violin and she's jumping and she's dancing around and um, the the judges were impressed. I mean, you had, um, what's his name? Ozzy Osbourne's wife that was on there. Yeah, Sharon. Sharon. Mm-hmm. Sharon Osbourne. And there was a, a few, Simon, I think Simon Cowell was on there as well. And there was maybe like two or three other people. And mm-hmm. um, they said that we don't think you're going to make it. We don't think that, you know, you're trailing around, you're missing tons of notes. It looks great, but it sounds horrible. They're like, we, we just don't really think that you can sell out at the stadium. We're sorry. We're going to have to pass. So she didn't give up. She kept going and she kept trying and she persevered. And she actually did end up selling out not only stadiums, but arenas. Um, and so yes. that is that I know that's a minor story. Um, but uh, there's been tons of cases where people have been told by professionals. Yes. Yeah. And, and, but right. she also matters. But, but listen if you're going to be a surgeon, this, like okay? if you're gonna be a surgeon, then yes, I want you to have a degree. <laughs> if you're yeah, in the medical field, on. I want you to have a degree. Mm-hmm. Hold on. Go back to Lindsay. Okay. Because their opinions made her better. Because at that moment in time, their opinions said, at this moment in time, your performance is not good enough to do this and mm-hmm. to be successful at it. Mm-hmm. But because of her, their opinions mm-hmm. as experts in this field and people who have been successful, she went mm-hmm. and made her act better and, and did the, and refined what she was doing because of their opinions. Right. And so, yes. And so even though the part of their opinion said, you may never make anything or may not be big enough, mm-hmm. That part of it, you know, you pick and choose what you what you need and what you want out of people's opinions. But because of their opinion, mm-hmm. it made her, it gave her a different drive to fix those things mm-hmm. and become better mm-hmm. and to show that um, if she refines this act, she can make something out of herself. So, mm-hmm. yes, I mean, it, they did matter. So what about the people that are told something similar? And I was told the, something similar right, when and, I was a kid. And, and, and you didn't I listen to that. I was told I would never be a musician. <laughs> well, but here's the thing mm-hmm. is that, you know, there is a difference in, you know, in the way that people give an opinion. Versus constructive um, criticism? Right. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And there are people who, you know, give opinions because they're jealous and they don't want you to succeed because they feel that they – they should be there, but they didn't do what they needed to, and they're afraid that you will surpass them. And so yeah. sometimes give opinions simply just to keep you from being successful. Yeah, that happens so way, there is a way difference. too often, especially yeah, like but the they always, keyboard, keyboard warriors. Yes, but they always matter because without that opinion, you know, it. and this is what makes entrepreneurs oh, who they are. <laughs> It's it's called resilience. Mm-hmm. It's called resilience. And because of someone else's stupid opinion, right. it's what made me pursue and say, you can't tell me what to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, so, I, I get it. It can be motivating. I, I like, I mean, there's just really different ways to frame it to, so you can turn a stumbling block into a stepping stone. You know, some, yes. some people believe that it's just, you know, opinions are just like, you know, opinions are just opinions. They're just like fart. They just disappear in the wind. They stick for a second and then they're gone. Yeah, but I think it's important <clears throat> that we listen to, you know, part of it and just take what we need from it mm-hmm. and just understand that sometimes people just don't know you and they're yeah. projecting on you. And so it may not apply to you, but mm-hmm. there is something that you could get out of it. And so rather than just completely disregarding what everyone has to say, right. maybe just take what you need. And sometimes it might just be, you know, an awareness that that's what you're putting off 
And, you know, and that's what other people's perceptions are. Mm -hmm. And even though that's not your thought process, if somebody sees that or perceives that of you, then that's a lesson for you. But right. their opinion, you know, it, take it with a grain of salt, but listen to the words mm -hmm. because there's always something that you can learn from it. So if there was someone, there is someone who, uh, who does want to get into the physical therapy industry and they're having trouble, they're having struggles what's something, what advice would you give them as far as perseverance and preparedness? I know you kind of like, you did kind of like, you did a really good job of kind of answering that already, but I kind of just want to kind of just like, what would you hone in on for that person? Well, first, I'm not going to talk about physical therapy because it's a whole different industry. Mm -hmm. um, and the med and the education requirements are completely different than what we do. But um, for somebody wanting to get into, say, specifically medical massage therapy. Me medical massage therapy is, is what I meant. I, yeah, I knew it, okay. it's what you meant, but I just wanted the listeners to um, be clear on this so that they didn't get confused. Um, the requirements for education for a massage therapist are pretty low. It's just a six or nine month school, depending on the, the state you're in. Some states do not even require a license, some just a certification. Mm -hmm. As a medical massage therapist, I'm going to tell you, you need much more than what you're going to get in a massage school. You're only going to get the basics. It's really important for you to go and take classes and advance your knowledge on human anatomy and physiology, understand um, biomechanics and how the body moves, understand medical terminology, and and I really, really understand different medical conditions that people have because they're go going to come and see you. And whether you can help them or not, you need to understand this. And then take some classes in business. You need to know how to run a business because you will be your own independent contractor unless you go work for someone. But the majority of the population of people who work in this industry are independent contractors. <clears throat> Excuse me. So educate yourself on what that means. Know the you know, it's important for you to understand your state's labor laws because people take advantage of you in so many different ways. And ignorance is not um, an excuse for someone taking advantage of you. It's your responsibility as an independent business owner mm -hmm. to know what your role is. Good. Good. That's a great answer. What's oh. if, yeah, so like getting the, getting the education, um, making sure you understand human anatomy, how the body works, making sure you understand business, um, cause most people are independent contractors. So you want to make sure that you're safe on that side. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, is that, but no, go ahead. You're gonna you're gonna need to know how to market also, mm -hmm. and you got to be willing to do the things that other people are not willing to do, such as <clears throat> network. I never see other massage therapists at my networking meetings, and you know this is a very personal business, mm -hmm. and so people want to know you. Um, you know, ad campaigns and things like that. It's not very personal, and so people are really buying you. And that means that you got to get in front of their face right. and and let them know who you are. So be willing to get out there and do the things that other people in your industry are not doing. Mm -hmm. And you will grow your business because they will buy you. And from there, you can expand. Is there like a, I'm pretty sure there's are there networking events for um, for massage therapists. Specifically for massage therapists. Right. I'm unaware of them. Okay. I know that they are. There are networking organizations out there for healthcare practitioners and for alternative um, practitioners. So people who, you know, are massage therapists, chiropractors, acupuncturists, things like that. But those are really more in metropolitan areas. Most of what you're going to see are things like just general business networking, um, leads groups, chamber of commerce, mm -hmm. things like that. Okay. So then they could, those are places they can go to actually at least get acquainted with their community or get acquainted with Get people. involved in all of them. Mm -hmm. um, figure out, you know, what, you know, I, I say try everything once and look at your ROI. Um, see how much money 
you got back out of that, how many leads you got that turned into sales and um, see if it paid for you to be in that group. If it didn't, don't go back to it. But you can visit most of your networking groups at least twice and meet a bunch of people and have some contacts to follow up on and decide whether or not that's going to be a good group for you based on the individuals who are in there. Right. So I think it's important that you go experiment. And I'll tell you where I learned sales is I knew that doing the work that I was doing, I've been a trainer for 20 years, a personal trainer and strength and conditioning specialist, mm -hmm. that growing my business initially, I looked around to see who – what kind of industry and what person works like I do strictly off commission, which is basically what we do off of sales. We trade um, hours for dollars. Yeah. And, and that was real estate agents. So I went to one of their conferences and I, I learned what we learned on how to sell. And because that's all they do is sell. They sell homes. Mm -hmm. um, they sell people. That's the only way they make money. So I went and learned from them and I brought it back and personalized it to my business and became much better at sales. Uh, that's a great idea to go to a real estate networking event. I went to a networking event and I went to one of their business conferences. And then a business conference for real estate mm -hmm. to learn to accelerate because they're selling homes. And if you're just yes. if you're selling, you know, a $250 course or whatever or product, um, or even five hundred dollars. That's still a lot less than you know a, a, a three hundred thousand dollar house, right? Yeah. But see, they exist strictly off of sales. Right. So I needed to know how they were taught to sell, mm. because no one teaches us how to sell in our industry. They teach us how to do our craft. Mm -hmm. So, but they don't teach us how to sell. So, is what, what were some takeaways that you actually got from that event? For people who are already um, who are already established, they want to get sharper. What's something that you personally learned from this on the sales side that was like this works for me, and these are the things that you picked up from the event. Well, one, it was I learned how to read people in a different way um, to know whether or not they were interested in how to really hone in on my message because how many real estate agents are there out there? A lot yeah. because you can drive down the street and there'll be 20 homes for sale and there'll be 20 different agents, right? right? So highly competitive market. One of the things that they taught is hone in on your specific message. Make sure that your message sets you aside as rememberable, uh, memorable and unique. Why would someone want to hire me when there's another trainer out there or another massage therapist just next door? Why would they come to me? So making sure that my message was clear to the point and um, showed who I was and what I did in a very unique way. And that you're it's essentially adding the right amount of value. Exactly. Which is why we're doing this podcast. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, and I think that's the biggest thing with our industry is they just teach you how to be a massage therapist, but they don't teach you how to be a business person. Mm -hmm. And you have to be a business person because if you cannot sell your business, you don't have any clients. And then if you can't keep those clients, you don't have a thriving, ongoing, continuing uh, source of revenue. All right, and this is just in, in the health industry, for everyone's listening, this is in every mm -hmm. industry. Yes. Yeah. Yep, it is. There are certain industries, like I said, the real estate agents who do a really good job of teaching, you know, sales techniques and um, business. And they didn't get that from going to school mm -hmm. or doing their real estate license. Mm -hmm. um, they had to learn it later on. And so if they're going to be successful, they need to know how to be a good salesperson um, besides just being a real estate agent. And that's the same for us. We need to know how to be a good salesperson because you are a salesman as alongside of being a massage therapist. Yep. You're selling somebody on something, whether it's an idea or to buy your product or something for your course or to cover your classes. <clears throat> There's something that they're going to buy. So yes. you're selling them so, something, even if it's just your point of view. It's so right. something that's being sold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So have a clear message and practice that. Okay. Good. Have a clear message, everybody, and practice that. 
if so if there are three people that you personally would like to sit down and have dinner with who would they be and why we're gonna get a little a little esoteric here a little broad here um and okay. just pl- play with this idea who would be three people that you would sit down and um and have dinner with and why well, I think the first one would definitely be my grandmother who's passed away, um, my uh, Ruth Starkey. The reason why is because she was always truthful to me, whether it hurt my feelings or not. But she she always did it with love. And she, um, she was a great guiding light for me. She was a strong woman mm-hmm. who was resilient. And even at the age of 90 years old, up on top of her roof, um, tarring her own roof and um you know so i would love to sit down and just have another conversation with her you know for guidance um the other i think with a lot of the work i do with disabled vets and with a lot of people who come in here with chronic depression because of their situations you know i think about robin williams a lot because i grew up with him and you know watching I know this dates me a lot, but um, Mork from Ork, um, as a little kid, he's the funniest man I've ever seen on TV. And I would love to have dinner with him to tell him how much joy that he has brought to people's lives just through laughter and, and looking at things from a different perspective and that how valued he is and how there is no shame in asking for help. There is no shame and and opinions don't matter in this place is that get the help that you need because your purpose is so much greater than the illness that binds you. And the last one would definitely be Jesus because um, I've got a lot of questions (laughs) and there are just so many things I need to know (laughs) that, you know, I, I get opinions from other people, but I need Jesus to tell me. And so I need to have dinner with him so that he can say, look, yes, I made you this way. However, I didn't expect you to do this. So (laughs) that's funny. Get get a little course correction there. Yes. (laughs) That is awesome. So So where can people find you like on 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 social, um, on Twitter, on Facebook, um, LinkedIn? you can find us everywhere. Our website is just dynamic dynamictherapeutics.net. Um, on Instagram, I'm the rec doc. So I do a lot of things outside massage therapy. I'm an adaptive sports specialist. So you'll see me on the water teaching disabled vets to kayak. Um, so I put a lot of those fun pictures on Instagram. And on our Facebook page, it's dynamic therapeutics and sports performance. And uh, you're welcome to email us at info at dynamictherapeutics.net and just ask us questions or just submit it through our website because I know people have questions and some weird questions and challenging questions. I love to hear them. And if I don't know, I have great resources that can help me answer that for you. That is wonderful. Thank you very much, Tanya, for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me and thanks for talking about something that um, other people probably would never think to listen to um, a massage therapy business. <laughs> There's a lot of wealth there. There was a whole lot of, a whole lot of, I think, great things that we actually ended up covering. Um, but um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching the show. And um, this is Kendall Mason from Giftbox Creative signing off. Thank you. You're welcome.